Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Oasis Church here on this third Sunday in Advent. We're excited to have you join us both online. We've welcomed you, and also live and in person and back here at Isaac Newton. Uh, excited to have the opportunity to be back here face-to-face, -face, and welcome to those who have joined us uh, here this morning. Uh, we invite you to just take a moment, if you haven't done so yet, and go to o oasisfamily.org and check in this morning. And let us know you're worshiping with us this morning. And again, on Facebook, sign in on those comments and let us know where you're worshiping, worshiping us from this morning. Uh, again, I'm Aaron, and excited to have you here. If you join me, we'll start today with prayer. Lord, what a, what a blessing it is to be back here face-to-face -face and online with you, um, coming together as a family, as a community here as Oasis Church, Lord, in this Advent season, as we continue to be prepared uh, for the coming of Christ, uh, and, and Lord, work on our hearts to be present in this moment so that today is about you, about glorifying you, and about learning more about how you want to use us, Lord, uh, in this community with one another to, to come close to you, Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I'm going to welcome up Christine now for a children's message. Good, good morning, Christine. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. It's good to be back in person and have all kinds of people to talk to, too, online and in person. Today marks the third Sunday in Advent. Uh, this season is such a happy season. It is December 13th, so there are 12 days until Christmas. So uh, I was going to have Aaron stay up here and see if he could recite the 12 things in the song that come along from the 12 days of Christmas, but he's kind of looking at me right now like, no, no. We didn't plan that, <laughs> but I do like to give Aaron a little grief sometimes, so that's kind of fun. But there's 12 days until Christmas, and this is a joyous time. The feeling of joy seems to bubble up inside of us this time of year. At least it does in me, and it just overflows, and it spills out around us, and we get so excited about Christmas. One of the best Christmas carols in my opinion is joy to the world, right? I mean, joy to the world. The Lord has come. And um, when we are experiencing joy, we want to share that with others. We want to, that's why it bubbles over. We're so happy and excited. We want that to spill over with our friends, with our family, with people we're around. And so one of the things I want to know, um, for those of you that are online and maybe here in person, you can just shout some things out. But what are the things this time of year, when you think about the holidays, you think about Christmas, what are those things that bring you joy? It could be small. It could be big. Um, what are some of the things that bring you joy? I'm just going to get my phone out of my pocket, and I'm going to just watch the chat for those of you that are online. And then any of you here that have anything that you want to just shout out, what are some of those things that bring you joy during the holiday season? When the cookies come out of the oven the right way, I just heard here in person. Good visit. Ooh, visiting family. Visiting family brings me joy too, and I'm really keeping my fingers crossed. We can do that this year. Yes, visiting Christmas music I see in the chat. Love Christmas music. And for kids, since this is the children's message, the best Christmas song is I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. It is. And if you've never heard it, make your parents find it on Spotify or YouTube or wherever. It's a great song. It will be stuck in your head all day, though, I promise. My kids getting excited about Christmas and being excited. That's from a mom. Um, seeing my friends. For me, one of the, um, it's like I'm a little kid again, are the lights. I love to drive around and look at the Christmas lights. So there's all kinds of things that bring us joy this holiday season that we share and it bubbles up. So today we're going to light the third candle in Advent on our wreath. And this candle represents joy. That's exactly what it represents. So I'm going to light that. There we go. All right. This candle represents joy, and it's also known as the shepherd's candle. Can you imagine how much joy the shepherds must have been experiencing when the angels came and told them Christ was being born? I mean, that would have been a joyous, such a joyous occasion. And to the shepherds' joy, those angels also told them... Um, that Jesus came for humble people like shepherds too, not just for righteous, holy, you know, they came for 
everyone, humble as well. The Bible also tells us that after the angel appeared to Mary, telling her that she was to be the mother of the Savior of the world, she hurried to the home of her cousin Elizabeth. And you're going to hear more about that today, I think. She just couldn't wait to tell someone. When Elizabeth heard Mary come into her house, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And Elizabeth was full of joy, and she was so full of joy um, to have a son that would turn out to be very important, that Elizabeth would have a son that would turn out to be very important in Jesus' life too. So Mary and Elizabeth are cousins, and they are so excited to be pre pregnant together with such important young men. Mary was so happy that she broke into joyful praise to God. And her words have come to be known as Mary's song and have been set to music by many composers. And this is some of what Mary says. Sings, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. So on this third Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of joy. Let us join Mary in praise to God, for he has done great things for us. He has sent us the gift of joy and love, his only begotten Son, that we may have eternal life by grace through faith in him. Father, we are thankful for your gift of joy. We rejoice with Mary for the great things you have done for us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
glory to God, huh? Can we hear it for him? Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Well, hello, I am Jody Skogan. I'm pastor of Oasis Church, and it's so good to see all of you today. I'm so glad that we have opportunity to rejoice, to have joy in who God is, and I get a little excited about who he is, so uh, yeah, I, I, no apologies there. He is phenomenal, and I can't wait for us to learn just a little more. May that be our prayer today, right? That, that he would just show us just a little more of how awesome he is. Uh, so why don't we pray and ask him to do that right now? All right, God, here we are, and um, we just thank you that you have called us to this moment to be together, whether online or in person, to think about who you are, to realize new things about you that we haven't yet understood or experienced. I pray, God, that today you would break in, break into our situations, break into our families, Lord, break into Oasis Church, break into our community with, with, with your presence, God. Would you do a mighty thing here, Lord? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're in a sermon series called, uh, what is it called now? Anybody remember? A little quiz time here. <laughs> no, I know. Prepared and present. Prepared and present. Here in this Advent season, God is the one who is prepared, and he is indeed present. Today, I want to talk about the reality of past, present, and future. And to be frank with you, tenses, like past, present, future, the pre past tense, present tense, future, that kind of makes me tense, actually. <laughs> and I'm an English major, okay? <laughs> I mean, is it sit, sat, or sitting? Uh, will be sitting? Yeah, probably. The one that gets me is the lay, lie, lying. How do you spell lying? At what time? In what way? I don't know. I mean, how important are those things? Those tenses, past, present and future can be kind of complicated. I mean, just watch Back to the Future. If you haven't seen the movies, pretty interesting. When we think about the past, what's happening in the present, what, what will happen in the future, how those all play in together. Um, interesting stuff. And uh, obviously, we're intrigued by that as a society because things like Back to the Future, which came out a long time ago now, um, are still really, like, very cool. And we like thinking about it. And all kinds of movies have been made about it. Past, present, and future. One verb that's interesting is the word respond. Okay? I responded in the past. Uh, I am responding presently and I will respond. Now, that might not sound all that interesting, but I promise you that that particular verb has a lot, it's a really important verb when it comes to our relationship with God and who God has been and how God has worked in the past, in the present, in the future. When I think of the word respond, I think about shopping at Target. I know, random thought. But if you uh, walk by a crew member or an employee of Target, often you'll hear their little radio, and uh, there'll be a, a message, and it'll say there's a call online, whatever, or somebody in electronics, whatever, okay? And, and then, have you heard this before? Then there's a little bit of time that goes, and then you hear the words, who is responding? Who is responding? They're waiting for someone to respond. I always think about Target when I think of that word response. So past, present, and future in regard to our response to who God is. And in the past, who has God shown himself to be? Who is God now? And what does he promise about the future when we think about past and present? and future. Uh, when I think of past, present, and future, a little tune comes to mind for me sometimes. If any of you have watched Schoolhouse Rock, anyone here? Raise your hand if you've seen some of those Schoolhouse Rock videos. There's a song that we like to sing uh, around our house, <laughs> sometimes randomly, um, and it's called Three is the Magic Number. I don't know if you've heard this one. Yes, thank you. Uh, we like it because there are three in our family. Uh, anyway, Dan and I definitely like the song. And uh, they t it's a really interesting song. You might want to Google it. Um, they talk about different threes. They actually mention the Trinity 
So uh, way in the beginning, they say the, that there was the, the, the mystic trinity. They're talking about God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they say past and the present and the future. Those are three really important, interesting things that come in threes, past, present, and future. And then I look at my ring and uh, my wedding, my engagement ring is really neat. I love it. When, uh, when I wondered if this really great guy, Dan, might be asking me to marry him, uh, and we talked a little bit about it, I, uh, I kind of, you know, I knew that maybe engagement would be in the future, and I wondered what my ring might be, and I think we probably talked about it a little bit. Uh, we've, we figured out that I would talk to my friend Cody about kind of what I, I wanted in a ring because I didn't want to go ring shopping with Dan. I don't know why. It just made me, just made me uncomfortable or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, I um, was looking through, you know, wedding magazines and probably saw a commercial on TV and I saw this ring. It was so beautiful and it had three diamonds in it and they stood for, I bet you could guess it, past, present, and future. And, uh, and so through um, Cody, and Dan picked out such a beautiful engagement ring, and he asked me to marry him one of the coolest days ever of my life. And so I look at my ring, and I think past, present, and future. Those things matter. They're really important. Our past sometimes frames up our present and certainly impacts our future. And so uh, we're going to talk in a Bible passage today um, about the past, the present, and the future. And I really want you to watch for um, evidence of, in this story, of references to past, present, and the future. So if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Last week, we had a great story, so if we think past for a second, last week, we were talking about Zachariah and Elizabeth, this older couple who um, were beyond childbearing years, who received this message from Gabriel. Uh, if you haven't watched uh, the sermon from last week, if you're online, I encourage you to do that, because that's really important past content that leads straight into this next story uh, that's in Luke 1, and we're going to start with verse 26. But before we get there, I just want to wake us up from potential apathy about the story we're going to be talking about because we've kind of gotten used to it. All right, there's this virgin girl. Her name was Mary. This angel appeared to her, said, hey, you're going to have a baby. She's like, oh, awesome. That sounds good. Sign me up. And then, right, we kind of get used. To, Listen, this is like earth shattering uh, situation here. Mary's life is actually the trajectory of the human race is changed in this moment. And so if we get kind of familiar with this story, I just want us to wake up to some new realities about it that we haven't maybe thought of before or we haven't really experienced before. So let's start with verse 26. In the sixth month, they're talking about Elizabeth's pregnancy, okay? So she'd been pregnant for six months with John, who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah Jesus, okay? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same one who appeared to Zechariah, the one who stands in the presence of God, mind you, I am Gabriel. Remember how he says that to Zechariah? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Not a really special city, I mean, if God's going to pick a city, why wouldn't he pick just like a really cool city, like where everybody wants to go and like they have tons of tourist opportunities? Or, you know, God picks this small town just kind of off the beaten path, just normal every day. I don't know. Is Cedar Rapids a little bit like that? I mean, I love Cedar Rapids. I've lived here a long time. There's really cool things about it, but I mean, it's not Los Angeles and New York City, right? And, and for some of us, we're glad for that. Um, so here it happens, verse 27, this angel Gabriel appears to a virgin betrothed um, or engaged to, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Doesn't mean he lived in David's house. It means he was in the lineage of David, okay? The virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her. Can you imagine that? An angel who stands in the presence of God comes to Mary 
and says, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. I know a lot of people in whatever situation they're in who would just love to hear God say, or or an angel say, God is with you. Whatever you're going through, God is with you. Whatever the lowest valleys you're in, God is with you. Even in the joys and the greatest joys, God is with you. The angel Gabriel appears and says, You, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But this is so earth-shattering for her that in verse 29, it says she was greatly troubled at the saying. And she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be like. What's happening here? What's going on now? And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. We've read the word favor twice in the last two sentences. Oh, favored one. And you have found favor with God. That word favor means grace. You have been graced. It's not like you bring anything special, Mary, to the, t- to the table. God is the one who is blessing you. You haven't earned it. You, you don't necessarily deserve it. He has graced you. You are graced, oh favored one, oh graced one. You have found favor with God. I would think that would be an encouragement. And then he goes on, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. What is he going to be like? There are a lot of parents who are expecting a baby who ask and wonder that question. Oh, what's my baby going to be like? We're going to have a boy, girl, tall, dark hair. What color eyes? Um, what will his or her personality be like? We kind of wonder those things when you're expecting a baby. But the angel Gabriel starts filling in the blanks way before ultrasounds <laughs> are around. <laughs> Mary gets this spiritual ultrasound that goes far deeper than what uh, gender this baby's going to be. The angel says, let me tell you what he's going to be like. Verse 30, 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the lord god will give to him the throne of his father david and he will reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end Very quickly, we realize this is no ordinary child. Now, no child is ordinary. Every child is exceptional. But this child is going to be great, this great angel says. And he'll be called the son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, Mary... She would have known who God the Father is. Throughout history, she and her people have remembered stories of how God has intersected with his people. And there have been prophets for hundreds of years who have been talking about this Messiah who was to come. And he would be the Son of God. And he would be the Most High. And there would be a kingdom established with the Messiah that would last forever. So when Mary's hearing this, she realizes quite quickly, I would imagine, that this child is the one that we've been anticipating for hundreds of of years, generations and generations going back have been talking about this Messiah who will change everything, who will take things that are broken and heal them, fix them, that will take the injustice that's so apparent in the world and will bring it into right righteousness. This is the one we've been waiting for, we've been anticipating. All of the past has been reminding us showing us, been like dominoes leading us to the moment in time when God himself will intersect and send the Messiah, and that's going to be your baby. Blow her mind, I can only imagine. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Are you hearing the past? Are you hearing the present? And are you hearing the future? 
Okay, and Mary then says to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now, um, if you remember from last week, Zachariah had a question to ask, and it kind of made the angel upset, actually, right? Gabriel is like, really? You're going to test God? You're going to doubt him? You're going to look for proof, even though I, who stand in the presence of God, am telling you I've been sent by God to you? What's the difference between Zachariah's question and Mary's question? Well, I, um, I know we mentioned this last week, and I needed to go to a scholar who I just really appreciate, N.T. Wright, And he writes this about that very thing. He says, we shouldn't miss the contrast between muddled, puzzled Zachariah in the previous story and the obedient humility of Mary in this one. She too questions Gabriel, but this seems to be a request for information rather than proof. So I had to throw that in. Uh, She's she's looking for um, some information but she believes. You can tell she believes because of what comes next. So she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answers her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. I need to tell you this. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, so you fast forward to after Jesus walked the earth and made disciples and healed people and taught so many things and and gave his life for us and was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. I'm fast forwarding through all of that for a second to Acts chapter 1, when we're promised that the Holy Spirit will come. Acts chapter 1 says that uh, there is going, in fact, let's just go there right now. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the same verb that is used here, and it's not used often in the New Testament, the same verb that's used with Mary here about how the the, uh, Holy Spirit will come and how this will be. Verse 8 of Acts 1 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that's talking to the people of God. That's talking about us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That is not just a promise for Mary, my friends. That is a promise that God gives us, us now. From the past to the present to the future, we know that the Holy Spirit wants to inhabit his people, that we might be kingdom pursuers, that we might be the ones who advance the kingdom of God on God's behalf. Okay, back to Mary. So this is how it's going to be, he says. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, oh, I love this. Okay, so now Mary, her family, you know, they talk, they, they have a relationship with each other. She has a relative named Elizabeth who is old in years, right? We talked about her last week. She hasn't been able to have a baby. That's a really big deal in her culture. Women are sort of pushed off, outcast when they, maybe something's not right with them if they're not able to have a baby. And then here we know that God acts in such a powerful way that Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And so Gabriel is talking to Mary and saying, hey, you want to know what else? Let me tell you what else God is up to. Listen, God has gone ahead. He has prepared the way in the past, not too distant past, because Mary, I want you to know Elizabeth, remember, who has kind of gone into seclusion for the first part of her pregnancy. The angel delivers to Mary the news that Elizabeth verse 36, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For, verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Not one thing will be impossible with God. And is this past, present, or future? He's talking about what's happened already in Elizabeth's life in the past, we are here in the present where Jesus, uh, the, the Gabriel is talking straight, speaking into the life of Mary, and then it's a present, it's a future tense statement. Nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary has an opportunity to respond. Remember the target analogy? Who is responding? Mary responds. Verse 36, she says, Behold, 
I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She responds to this good news. She doesn't just stand there. She responds. Out of what happens with her, she says, yes, I give you my permission. This is what, I, yes, I am your servant. I'm willing to do whatever. You just tell me how and where I am, and, and I'm there. And the angel departs from her. So she rushes pretty much right away off to her cousin Elizabeth. She's got to go talk to Elizabeth. She walks in the door of the, of the home, and we see what happens. The, the baby inside of her. Now, Elizabeth would have been familiar with what it's like to have a baby move as, as the baby's developing in her womb. She would have been familiar with that in the sixth month. But this is, something else happens here, so much so that it gets recorded in the Gospel of Luke. It says that when she, uh, Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you. I mean, Mary hasn't even gotten a word out of her mouth. The Holy Spirit moves in such a mighty way that it's so clear to not just Elizabeth, but to her son, John, in, in her womb, that this baby, who they've just come into pro, uh, proximity to, will change everything, is the one ex expected from the past and is here now in the present. She says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Is this not the first confession recorded certainly in the gospel of Luke of someone saying Jesus is Lord? It's really the first creed of the, of the Christian church. Jesus is Lord. Elizabeth hasn't even met this child and knows that my Lord has come into my house and she responds. For behold, verse 44, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then Mary responds. Mary responds with a song. Thank you, Christine, for talking a little bit about that this morning. She responds with joy. Like, I don't know if anything could have kept her from, from singing praise to God. And so let's look at this song, the lyrics of this song that she sings. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Is that, can that be your heart's cry today based on what God has done in your past? Or maybe what he's doing in the present? Or if neither one of them seem all that exciting, have we looked at scripture to say what we can count on for the future? Can we have that be our song? My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation, think of the future, to generation, to generation. He has shown strength. He is strong. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance, think of the past, in remembrance of his mercy through these generations as he spoke, verse 55, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Do you hear the past? In fact, actually, some of the lyrics in her song are echoes of songs from the Old Testament. We're maybe not as familiar with those because we could study them more. But Mary would have heard these stories over and over. Maybe there's some worship songs, some hymns that you just love. 
And when you're praising God just on your own, if you haven't had this opportunity, I encourage you to look for it. Maybe you're just getting ready in the morning and you start thinking about who God is and lyrics can come to mind for you about who God is based on some favorite songs. Do you guys have, I'm going to just ask you, any favorite hymns or favorite worship songs that you just love? Put you on the spot here for a second, but think about that. Amazing grace. So maybe in your day when you are just recognizing in a new way of God's presence, that song, that was those lyrics might come to your mind. How about another one? How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. That's kind of what Mary's doing, isn't it? Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Yeah. How about another one? On eagle's wings. Oh, on eagle's wings. And all of these songs really quite quickly we can recognize characteristics of God based on them. You will, you will, how does that go, Brian? Um, and he will raise me up on eagle's wings, bear me on the something of dawn. Yeah, I mean, we're going to be singing that later <laughs> and it'll come to me. But those lyrics are things that remind us of who God is in the past. And so she's singing them and she's responding to who God is and what he's done. We can see past and present and future. There's a word that we hear reoccurring in this passage, and it's the word behold. Now, that's not a word we use very much here in 2020. I don't anyway. Uh, but the word behold is like the word look. I, I have a story for you. Um, when we were, gosh, I don't know how many years ago it was, our daughter Tara, she was like five. She was in kindergarten. And we took a trip to California. And I was super excited for her to be able to see the ocean for the very first time. I was like, that's going to be so cool. I wonder what she's going to say or I wonder what she's going to think. She's just going to be in awe of it. I mean, because it's so phenomenal, right? We went to Santa Monica. If you've ever been to Santa Monica or the Santa Monica Pier um, in the Los Angeles area. And, uh, and I like LA, by the way. I wasn't trying to put down LA earlier. Uh, so anyway, we uh, get to Santa Monica. And the way it's set up is it's kind of on a cliff, essentially. So you can't necessarily see the ocean from every place in Santa Monica. So we park our car in a parking uh, lot, and we're going to walk toward the pier, toward the ocean. And I, again, I'm like anticipating this moment. I can't wait to watch her face like as she sees the ocean, how huge it is, because we're kind of up high. And if you've been to the Santa Monica Pier, you might be able to picture this a little bit. Um, behold, in your mind, okay? And we're walking toward this sort of ridge where you're going to be able to see the ocean in 180 degree view. And um, we are walking, getting closer and closer. I'm watching Tara. We come up over the ledge and she can see the ocean, but she says, Mom, look, they have a carnival here. <laughs> Because if you've been to the Santa Monica Pier, there's like a Ferris wheel and there's like a tent, Cirque du Soleil or something was on the beach. Anyway, and I was like, what? Look, Mom, they have a carnival here. Like, we have those in Iowa, honey. But anyway, behold, behold, look. And I love it how there's multiple times, I think it's five times in this passage in the ESV, which is the version I really like of the, of the Bible. Um, behold, the angel says. Behold, look, don't miss it. Take a look what God is doing, what he has been doing, what he is doing currently, and what he's about to do. And then it occurs to me that what we see, what we behold, we respond to. Tara saw the carnival. She responded to that. We should respond to the things that we see. Perhaps you've been in a car driving and all of a sudden you see a deer. It's best to respond. What you see, it's important to take action on. But then in, there, in some joys, we can respond as well. Uh, we can, when we hear great news, maybe you hear of an engagement. 
Maybe you hear of a really great test score. Maybe you hear a great result from a medical test. Uh, perhaps you hear um, good news in the news. I'd love to hear more of that. That would be really good. We hear good news and we also respond. That's what we see in Mary. I want to tell you about an uh, experience that I've had of watching people respond. It was a few years ago now, four to be exact. Now, I am not a baseball fan. I think I've mentioned that before. Uh, don't know a lot about baseball. Really don't need to. It's, I mean, I don't, it's okay. But I was able to behold a setting that I might never forget. It was 2016, and I was with a bunch of people who were watching the final game in the World Series uh, where the Cubs, Chicago Cubs, were playing. And everyone that I could tell, at least the verbal ones in that room, were all rooting for the Chicago Cubs. And uh, I won't forget their responses. I mean, perhaps some of you, anybody here Cubs fans? I know we have some online, okay, okay. All right, okay. Do you remember where you were when the Chicago Cubs won the World Series? Like that moment, you probably have it framed. I do, and I don't even really know what Cubs are. All right, I remember that very, very clearly. Well, what people were experiencing in that moment, they responded to. They responded in the place I was in with great excitement. I mean, everything in them was exploding. Hey, I want to show you a video clip uh, that gives you a, 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 just a glimpse of what the response looked like on that day for Cubs fans. But before I get to that, I want to rewind in the past. Because we're talking past, present, and future. When you rewind to 1991, which some of you weren't even born, and don't tell me who. I don't want to know. It makes me feel old. In 1991, Harry Carey, who was the legendary commentator for the Chicago Cubs, um, he, uh, I guess it was the end of the Cubs run that year, 91. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Anyway, Harry Carey uh, makes a statement in the midst of the disappointment of the present for him about what the future might hold for the Cubs. So I want to show you that clip first as we look back to the past. Too bad we couldn't have had a victory to vent a pennant, but that will come. Sure as God may green apple, someday the Chicago Cubs are going to be in the World Series. Okay, 1991, in the midst of disappointment, he makes uh, this hopeful statement that in the future, the Chicago Cubs will make it into the World Series. As sure as God made green apples, became kind of a famous statement among Chicago Cubs fans. Well, fast forward to 2016, when we actually do see that uh, past hope become a present reality. Check this out.
when something great happens, we can't help but respond. Now, I don't want to diminish the great news about the Cubs winning the World Series in 2016. Definitely was something to rejoice about. But I wonder if we've let the good news about Jesus sink in. He who has been present in the past from generation to generation, merciful and steadfast and gracious in the midst of the ups and downs and the hills and the valleys, is the same one who promised for all of that time to bring to us one who will make all things wrong, right. Everything that's broken, healed. And then he does it where they've been waiting. I mean, it was like 108 years or something the Cubs waited for the World Series. Listen, we're talking hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, where we've been waiting for this Messiah to come, and Mary gets the news, and oh my word, how does she respond? We hear it in her song of praise. Let's not miss the celebration in her voice, and let's not miss that this gift is not just for Mary. It is for us and for the whole world that the world might have freedom where there's been captivity, where they might receive healing, where there's been woundedness and brokenness and despair, where there's hope when we have been hopeless, when we've been wondering what will come for now and in the future. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Can that be our response as we think about who God is, who he's been, and who he will be? My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit, it rejoices. Thank you for the candle reminder, Christine, about joy. The angels proclaim it. The shepherds recognize it. Mary meets this angel who says, this is going to be your story and the story of the Messiah. And now it's time to rejoice. We experience it. We see it. We behold it. And we respond. Let that be our story, that we respond in joy, that a worship song isn't just a bunch of t notes or, or lyrics kind of chained together that last about four minutes until uh, we're done with the worship service. No, instead, it becomes our life where we say, God, may you be magnified. May I proclaim to the world how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee, how great thou art. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Help me respond, Lord. Help us respond out of your goodness. May that be what our lives resemble. And when they don't, hey, guess what? God's grace keeps showing up. And we can rejoice in that too. Past, present, and future, our God is there. And we can stand on it and we can respond to it. So let's pray in response. Lord God, right now, I know we only see in part, we, we've only seen a, just even a sliver of your might and your power and your, your, your presence. But this Christmas season, God, as we behold the miraculous work of you in our world, may we respond, God, not on a surface, but from deep within us and where we struggle, God, I thank you that you meet us there too. And, and where we doubt, I thank you, God, that you meet us there also. And God, I, I just thank you for what you've done and how you haven't stayed far off and away, but God, that you have come close, that you are God with us, that you are Emmanuel. So this Christmas, we want to give you our hearts And we want to say thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you go with us, that you've been with us, that nothing in our past 
has diminished your power. Nothing in our present diminishes your power, and nothing in the future. Well, the future God, it will display, it will magnify your power. And so help us respond to you. Come into our hearts. Come into our lives. Forgive us for our sin. And uh, give us great joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to respond with a worship song. Go tell it on a mountain. You can't be uh, ashamed or sort of step back on that. Let's proclaim it, okay, by the power of God, and let's respond. So if you would stand with me and let's, let's respond. Let's praise him. Hotel on the mountain. Um, we are going to end with one more song, but before that, I just want to mention that if you have on your heart to, to partner with Oasis Church uh, to help people experience abundant life and would like to give in regard to an offering, you can do that by texting 84321 with the amount, and then uh, um, you'll just uh, fill some information out there really briefly, and that's really simple if you'd like to do that. Um, our hope is to bless people, particularly this Christmas. Our high school ministry is going to be blessing people.
people. This Wednesday, we're going to be going shopping for uh, some families who have need to be blessed as a response, right, to what God has done for us. And that's really what offering is. It's a response to what God has done for us. So we're going to close um, with a song all about praise as we respond to God. But please receive this sending just before that. Um, as you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that's, that's in whose name we go. So let's respond in praise. Church, let's sing this together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior.
been a joy to worship the Lord with you today, either here in person or online. Thanks for joining us. Um, do you want you to know that there are some discussion questions or reflection questions that are going to come up on the screen right here at the end of the service? You might want to think about what God's doing and stirring in your heart. Um, so we will see you next week. I also want you to know Christmas Eve worship service here in Oasis Church uh, online and in person at Isaac Newton Christian Academy in the Patriot Center, 7 o'clock on Christmas Eve. So please join us as we worship the newborn king together. God bless you. See you next week.